Hello, I'm Trey Ratcliffe, and welcome to season one of the new show. We wanted to do something very different. I think the number one question that I get, um, strangely, is not really how do you make these photos look like that or how do I take good photos? You know, I get plenty of those. Uh, but a lot of it is how did I uh, come to be or how did I create myself or what's my story? What what series of events happened to make me, me? How did all this come to pass? And, you know, of course it's very personal. And we wanted to make this whole series very, very personal. Where I tell you all kinds of stories about my past, me as a kid, traumatic, embarrassing things that have happened, even traumatic, embarrassing things that have happened as a, a grown-up, which I, I guess I am now little life lessons that I've kind of figured out along the way, mostly by accident, and how I've kind of applied those to my ever-evolving artistic life. Because I think, you know, becoming uh, an artist is all about getting older and kind of taking all the various things that happen in your life and assimilating them into some kind of a whole. So this is a big emphasis of the series, is these personal stories. Uh, but at the same time, I'm always taking photos, as, as always, and um, you'll see me do lots of that in all kinds of situations. And there'll be lots of post-processing at the end. So the series is kind of like many different episodes, and every episode I start out telling a, a story, uh, something that I've kind of carried forward from the story, and then I take some photos and post-process. So there's still plenty of the, you know, the good, fun, post-processing, artistic kind of stuff. And in a way, this has always been kind of influenced by Bob Ross. I love Bob Ross. I don't know if you know who he is or not, but I used to watch his shows all the time and just watch him paint and hear him talk and just um, it was mesmerizing. So I feel like, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe this will be interesting to you too. Because I do talk a lot and think out loud while I do these sorts of things. But I'll start out now by kind of answering the number one question that I get, um, you know, how did this come to pass? Um, how did you create yourself? What's your story? And I remember um, starting out um, as a little kid, and of course you never know what you're going to become. You, you think you could become anything as a little kid. Um, you know, I was born, um, and I can only see out of one eye. I can still only see out of one eye. Um, I went through sports. Um, everything from soccer to baseball, and I really wanted to be good at baseball. And I couldn't because I could only see out of one eye. And I wanted to, you know, be awesome at sports to make my, my parents proud. And, and what ended up happening is um, I felt like it was unfair that I, I couldn't see uh, like everybody else. And, but it ended up being a good thing because it forced me um, into a life of sort of computers, I guess. I got really into, uh, into computers and that kind of took me down a different path, which was very nice. Um, and as I was getting to know computers, I um, mean, you know, I'm a kid now, this is sort of like late 70s. I got a, a Commodore 64, I had a, a Timex Sinclair 99. At some point I kind of upgraded it to the 256K RAM thing so I could, I could do even more programming. And I was not a great programmer, but it was really interesting that I could take a, take a computer and an idea and make something happen. But I think kind of one of my great insights came in high school. Um, I went to Jesuit College Prep in Dallas, Texas. It was an all-boy school, and we had to wear uh, a, a tie every day, like a coat and a shirt and a tie and khaki pants and this sort of stuff. And I had, um, I think it was my sophomore year, I had this amazing computer science teacher and math teacher. He taught two classes. His name was Peter Billingham. Wonderful guy. And we were programming in the computer lab on TRS-80s. And so I went in there and it was time for my um, assignment. I had to come up with something that I was going to program. I wasn't sure what to do. And, you know, everyone else in the class seemed so smart. And, you kind of assumed that everyone else knew what was going on except for me. And, but my teacher, Peter Billingham, uh, believed in me for whatever reason. 
And I remember I was sitting there in the computer lab, kind of blankly staring at the screen, trying to figure out what I should be doing or what I should be programming. And I had my coat off. I just had that, that you know, ironed white um, you know, Oxford shirt on. And he came up behind me and he put his hand on my shoulder in a way that I knew I wasn't in trouble. It was a very kind of tender way. You know when a teacher comes up to you and, and they, they kind of touch you on the shoulder and you, you feel like, they're going to impart some kind of knowledge. It's sort of like a moment I had. So my, my world kind of stood still for a moment. And he goes, Trey, why don't you try making a program that shows how to plot polynomial equations to show the parabola. So you could type in a polynomial and you would see the parabola appear. And I thought, well, that sounds awesome, but I have no idea how to do that. You know, I barely knew what a polynomial was. And then he kind of went around the front of me and he said, Trey, you can eat an elephant with a spoon if you cut it into very small little bites. I thought, oh, I thought, what, is, what a strange thing to say. And it didn't really, didn't really make a lot of sense to me at the time. But I went and started researching polynomials to figure out everything I could. How do they work mathematically, so on and so forth. You know, why when you plot them on a Cartesian plane do they make these parabolas? What is a parabola? Is this sort of a naturally occurring thing? What's the difference between nature and computers and math and, and this sort of thing? Uh, but lo and behold, I ended up making it. And it worked great and I felt really proud of myself. And he, he never said good job. It was just an optional thing. I never got a grade for it. But, you know, I could see that he was proud of me. Um, and I think that's, that's what good teachers do. So that kind of got the bug in me early on in high school that I could, that I could create anything I wanted to, no matter how big or strange or unknown it is to me. So I had such a good experience there. I went on to college, also there in Dallas, Texas, where I grew up, and I majored in computer science and math, and um, that was great. I was actually really ready to get out of university, though. I found it to be a little slow-paced or something. I really wasn't much of a partier. I was pretty lame. You know, I, I basically played computer games and watched movies and read a lot of books, a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. Um, my mind was always in another world. You know, I, I think my body would be there in the classroom, but my mind was always off in the stars someplace. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't think I wanted to be a computer programmer, but it seemed like a good way to make money at the time. And, you know, the, back then everyone is just obsessed with making money and stuff like that. And of course, there's a practical side to life where it's good to do that. So right after that, I graduated and got a job at uh, Anderson Consulting, uh, which is a big consulting firm. Now they're called Accenture. And my very first job, very first client was out at CNN in Atlanta, Turner Broadcasting. And actually, my first boss is right here in the, in the boat in front of me. We're here in Botswana, by the way. This is here in Africa. That's where a lot of this first um, series is shot, um, Curtis. And so we got to be really good friends. Uh, this is all about 20 years ago, and he taught me even more about programming and uh, business and, and this sort of stuff. We had probably, I don't know, 300 people there at CNN, and we're kind of re-programming um, the way they keep track of all of their advertise all our advertisements, all of their commercials for all their various um, businesses. So that's where I learned a lot about the, the broadcast industry, and I was programming and kind of doing businessy sort of stuff to, to, um, to figure out how that works. So I learned a lot about business back then. Um, so, uh, and I kind of enjoyed that job. It wasn't so bad. I didn't feel like um, it was my calling in life. You know, I was paid well, I guess, this sort of stuff. Um, right around then is when I got married. Um, my wife, Tina, also worked at Anderson Consulting a long time ago. Um, and then after that, I ended up quitting um, Anderson Consulting and I joined a smaller firm, another consulting firm just in Dallas. I did more of the same kind of thing, but I jumped around and did many kinds of businesses. I did um, telecom, um, we did supply chain management, um, healthcare, um, you name it. So. I went around and did different kinds of technology implementations in different kinds of environments. And after a while, you realize that all businesses are kind of more or less the same. 
um, just different kind of instantiations of the technology for each situation. And so, you know, at this stage, I'm kind of like in my early 30s, and I decided to branch out and do some entrepreneurial things. And maybe it's because I just read Atlas Shrugged and then The Fountainhead. I was really into Ayn Rand, and a lot of things she said made a lot of sense to me. You know, sort of rugged individualism and this sort of thing. And I guess a lot of rugged individualism just didn't fit in with my corporate IT life. And I always felt very much like an individual. I didn't really ever feel like I fit in. Um, and the whole time, I kind of kept my creative mode sort of on a soft simmer in the background. Um, I had written a, a novel that had been summarily rejected by everybody. That's a story that I tell in another episode here. Um, I'd been doing ceramics and pottery. I'd been doing a lot of other creative writing. But it really wasn't the main focus of my life, creativity. I felt like being entrepreneurial was sort of a, a form of creativity where I could actually create something that had never been created before. So I started a uh, little television software company and got some funding for that. Um, and that kind of worked out. Um, I, during that time I got about a dozen patents, um, learned a lot about that system and the legal system and that sort of thing. I found out I had very little tolerance for it. <laughs> Um, and then um, I started a game company, um, I guess in my mid-30s. And uh, we created this really cool game, uh, which I'll talk about another time. That's a whole other whole other story. Um, and it was going pretty well. And we actually had studios um, all over the world that were helping us make this game. So I would start traveling quite a bit. And I found out that I really enjoyed... Um, taking photos when I was out at these places because they were just amazing. I was so so blown away by the different cultures and the way people dressed and the way they looked. Um, just everything. I was infatuated and I really wanted to capture it. So that's when I really started taking photos while I was um, kind of running this game company. And then what happened is um, it looked like we had kind of a hit on our hands. We thought we might do pretty well. so. We, uh, we started dramatically expanding the, the size of the company and we brought in another CEO to take over because I'm, I'm honestly much more the creative type. I'm not like, you know, super boss man that knows how to, you know, motivate a hundred people or whatever. I know how to motivate like dreamers like me. That's no problem. Those, these are my people, the dreamers. And actually the whole company, uh, you know, Bell who's holding the camera, uh, Pete and Curtis and everybody, we're all, we're all dreamers here. I think these are the best people. But anyway, um, I sort of drifted back into the background of the company, you know, and I was still traveling around, and um, I really wasn't doing that much stuff anymore. Uh, I didn't really have much of an active role, but I really found myself getting more and more into the photography, uh, into HDR, into experimentation, uh, post-processing. Um, you know, I never taken a class in photography. I never read a book on photography. I'm totally self-taught. Uh, but it just kind of felt like the right way to go. And along the way, I discovered many things about photography, about myself. And I think there's this wonderful concept of slowly adding art into your life. And the more art you add into your life, the more creative you become, and the more you create yourself. Because you don't actually find yourself, you create yourself. And the more you involve yourself in artistic endeavors, the more you can create that self. There's this quote from one of my favorite authors, Ray Bradbury, a sci-fi writer. He wrote The Martian Chronicles and these sorts of things. And he says, we are cups constantly being filled. The trick is knowing how to empty all the beautiful stuff out. And I think that's a lovely thing. And it is kind of a trick, isn't it, to figure out how to empty out the beautiful stuff and become open and vulnerable. And I think the more artistic you are and the more you practice this sort of creativity, the easier this becomes. So I went on taking photos and I had a blog, stuckincustoms.com. 
Um, I would write every day. I would put up a new picture every day, and I just loved it. I did it for years, and no one noticed. It was just me and my mom that came to the lonely thing. We never did any advertising or any marketing or anything. It just grew uh, by word of mouth. I don't even know how it happened. It's a, it's a shock to me that it was uh, successful and that it's still successful. I, I don't take any of it for granted. I don't take any of the travel for granted. I don't take any of my cameras or the people around me in my life. I take none of it for granted. I just cannot, I really can't believe it. Because I feel just like a, a little kid that likes to take pictures. Like a little boy who's still kind of just constantly experimenting and never really sure. And I think that's actually a safe, safe spot to be in. And so here we are now. Um, we're here in Africa. And I kind of had a, a revelation just, um, just yesterday. Uh, it was one of the first times I had seen an elephant in the wild. And we had been seeing lions and lion cubs, these little lion families out kind of hunting and, you know, saw a few little playful takedowns, stuff like that. And I thought, well, you know, how on earth could a, a pride of lions take down a giant elephant? These things are enormous. I wouldn't even know you would get a grip on this thing. Uh, but they do it. And it made me think back to when I was in high school. And Mr. Billingham told me that I could eat an elephant with a spoon if I broke it into little parts. And I'm sitting here realizing that I've actually eaten an elephant. And I can't believe it, he was right. And this whole time I didn't realize I was breaking it into little parts, but I was. And so I've kind of had this journeyman's life with IT and entrepreneurism and having many different jobs. Um, and maybe you're like me, you kind of have this gentle throb in the back of your head that you were meant to do something else you were meant for great things, you were meant to create, that you were meant for more on this earth. But you're not sure what that is. And so you kind of stumble through life, right? I can say that I've easily stumbled through life. But what happens is you are accidentally preparing for some kind of greatness that you don't know yet. And so I think what happens is you end up stumbling into your own greatness. And you can get there through creativity, finding yourself, and rugged experimentation, becoming more of an individual through this creative life. And that's so much what this series is about. So I hope you have a great time with me. Um, I hope you learn a lot. I hope you get inspired. Um, I'm honored that you're gonna be here with me the whole time. And it's gonna be amazing. Hello and welcome back to my studio. This is where we'll be coming after each of these kind of live action shots. And you'll see me share my screen. You'll see me process photos and just generally kind of talk about photography in sort of a kind of Bob Rossi kind of way, I guess. Um, let's start here. I want to I want to show you just a bunch of different uh, photos that we're going to be working on here in, in season one. Uh, these are some of my favorites and you know every episode features a sort of a different location and a different story that will lead into the production of a work uh, such as this uh, this is one of my favorite photos i took this in namibia out in the desert um, these amazing quiver trees and i tried to position it such that the quiver trees would open up into the, the milky way this is actually one of the more complex shots that we're going to work on later in the series because it's actually a panorama this was composed out of six different photos. Okay, uh, Here's one of my favorite shots of the whole trip. We tracked this lap leopard forever, and I zoomed in really tight and uh, was able to get a good shot here. Um, now, these have all been processed. These are sort of the after shots. Okay, So you're going to be able to see all the befores and after as well in the, uh, the full series. Here's uh, this amazing place we went to with the... Uh, the sand dunes had taken over this town in Namibia. It's a ghost town. It was abandoned uh, not just a few decades ago. It's an old diamond mining town. Just amazing to shoot it. Um, here's another scene from that uh, very fun shot. Kind of, I had uh, Belle, uh, who you know shot the whole video. Uh, she immediately put up the devil horns when I said make some devil horns. She just knew how to do it. Um, here's a shot from the quadcopter. We have a whole episode on flying quadcopters and aerial photography that I think you'll like. This is another one of those shots from above that is uh, kind of wonderfully confusing. I love it. 
Here's one of these trees. This is a compression shot. We'll talk about the importance of compression and different kinds of zoom lenses in, in your photography. Uh, here's a long shot. This is uh, kind of Belle walking off into the distance on this giant sand dune. I mean, I barely made it up that thing. I was on my last legs, I'll, I'll be honest. Now, here's a view from the very top of the dunes looking down. And, you know, when you see these two people off in the distance at the top right, you can kind of see it. But up until then, it's confusing. And I do like these kind of confusing shots. Um, we also did some, a little bit of uh, modeling work. That's the desert rose there on the left. And uh, so we did quite a bit of people photography here too. So you get to see how I approach that and some of my theories and, and this and that. That's a really fun episode. Uh, we do talk about details too. This is details of some of the sand. Sometimes it's important to pay attention to the details as you're running around looking at the giant, um, awe-inspiring landscapes. We went to a small village there, too. And it was full of um, some of the locals, and uh, this girl was just awesome. She had sort of this red painted face, and she was really sweet. Um, so you get to see me take photos of her and how all that worked out. Um, this is also in that village. This is where they were making some, some fire. Really interesting to watch, really fun. Um, here's another shot of the leopard uh, up in the tree. This one's a little bit more zoomed out. This is, she has her kill there. It's a warthog that she killed and she hung over the tree. And then she had to run up there to protect it from a bird of prey that was uh, about to pounce on it. Um, here's uh, one of the shots of the desert rose in the water. Um, here's another one. This is after, she was so cold. Um, and so she got out and I love the way the tones ended up in this one as she was drying off beside the wall. Here's one of the elephants we saw. I do love elephants. They turned out to be my favorite animal to shoot the whole trip. We also do a few studies in black and white and talk about how this is a really cool form of photography and I'll, I'll show you how I convert a lot of my shots to black and white and my, my process for it. Um, Actually, I shot this right after Belle finished shooting that intro segment you just saw. Um, she kind of set down her video camera and I, I turned the camera the other direction and, and took a shot of her running her hand through the water. I love this shot. Actually, we're lucky there wasn't a hippo in there. It could have been. It could have been the end of Belle's hand. Um, here's another one of my favorite pieces that I create this season. Um, this is um, a memory of elephants, isn't it? And a great name for a group of elephants. I think that poets must come up with these names for groupings of animals. But yeah, this was a really fun thing to make. So we do a bit of a little texture tutorial as well. And then this shot, of course, is also one of my favorites. We slept on top of the roofs of these places. And uh, my friend and I, Renee, we shared a roof one night and we set up our cameras to do a star trail uh, right before we went to bed. And this is how it looked when we uh, groggily woke up the next morning. Awesome. Okay, let me give you a, a brief tour of some of the tools we'll be using uh, this season. Okay. Um, and also, we have all of the tools listed on my website. If you go to stuckincustoms.com, uh, we have links to all the tools as well as reviews and more information. So if you just go up to the top, you can see what kind of equipment and the kind of stuff that I use. Just click on that link and you'll be good to go. So this is the primary tool we're going to be using. It's called Adobe Lightroom. Okay. And Adobe Lightroom is great for organizing your photos and processing your photos. It does both. And nowadays, you really got to have your photos organized, don't you? Um, you can see up here I have my photos kind of organized by year. We have a little tutorial on Lightroom as well coming up in one of the first episodes. And down here I have collections. And here you can see some of the, the before and after photos that, uh, that we worked on. Okay. Like for example, um, if you look at this one, this is sort of the, the before of the walking in the desert one. And if we jump back over here to Lightroom and I show you the after of that one, um, then you see this after and before. So you get to see everything we did to that one. And then let's go down and look at one more before and after. Uh, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time with HDR photography as well, which is something I guess I'm kind of known for. And for example, this is the before shot of an HDR shot. This is sort of taken right out of the camera. And then after I'm done processing it, it looks like that. 
So you can see there's just a tremendous difference. So how can anything go so easily from this to that? Well, you'll find out how, and you'll find out how fun and easy it is as well. All right, let's go back here into Lightroom. So if this is your first time in Lightroom, I think you're gonna find it to be a really fun tool to use. And we'll talk about how all this stuff works, what's happening, we'll talk about everything over here on the right hand side. We'll talk about the develop module and how you can just very easily pop into the develop module and try things. Like for example, if I go down here to um, uh, this photo of uh, Belle doing yoga, um, you can see how there's a full history here of everything that happened. And this is from the initial import. So this is kind of what it looks like when it first came in. And then you can see all the steps that have happened to kind of get it to its, its final fruition. Like all this kind of stuff, right? And then it gets here and it ends up looking, you know, kind of awesome. Um, we'll talk about presets. Like for example, I can if I reset this back to its normal state. I've got one of my favorite presets here. It's called Bright Sharpie. And you can see the dramatic effect it already has. And we can, of course, go over here and further tweak it out. We'll just do a quick crop. Let's see, get this kind of steady with the horizon. I was falling down a little bit. I was I was on a sand dune. Things were getting a little cray cray up there. All right, so there, hit that enter. We could also, you know, brighten it up. Um, you'll learn all about these great sliders, like the shadow ones. Like you can see the shadows there on her. But as I increase the shadows, we can pull those up. This is just a magical tool. I love it so much. All right, now some of the other tools that we're going to use, I'll touch on. Um, we're going to be using Adobe Photoshop. We'll be using that for a few intermediary type tricks, um, a few advanced ones too. Um, a last tool that we'll use is AutoPano to do our, um, our panoramas. Okay, we have a few plugins we're going to use also, like MacFun plugins, some Nick plugins from Google, all kinds of good stuff. All right. Well, I am super excited to go through this whole season with you. I think it's going to be totally amaze maze. I think you're going to learn a lot. And I love teaching. I love doing this kind of stuff. And I'm honored that you're watching. And I'm honored that you're going to be with me the whole time. So I think it's just going to be unbelievable. All right. Well, I will see you very soon in the next episode. You've got to keep yourself super uncomfortable. It's counterintuitive. Uh, but the more uncomfortable you make yourself, the more you try different things, the more you experiment, you've got to have this sort of uh, tension in order to create something interesting.